blessedhopefellowship.org and go to the missions tab and you can click on either one of those uh, links and go to um, either one of them and read more about the people that we support. Okay. What will be your legacy? Um, we are continuing to talk about First uh, Peter chapter 1 verse 10 through 12 and uh, leaving a legacy of devotion to the Bible is our subject today. So let's uh, turn to um, our focus passage, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Again, that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word and pray that your spirit give us illumination today that we may understand fully about our own devotion to the Bible or the lack thereof and how important it is for us to leave a legacy of devotion to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So leaving a legacy, we, we've been talking about this the uh, last couple of weeks and, and again, we can't stress it enough that we, when we think about leaving a legacy, we often think about, you know, working hard at our job so we can have more money in the bank when we pass on, about getting life insurance policies, um, about acquiring wealth and things that we can actually leave to other people. But those are not the more important things because Scripture is very clear. It says, do not store up for yourselves things on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Those things are temporary things. But the things that we can leave behind, the things that will last not just our lifetime, but lifetimes after our lifetime and into eternity, are the things that matter most. And so far, we've discussed about leaving a legacy of faith. That's what Brandy was talking about um, in reading Mission Moments today. How important it is for us to leave a legacy of faith, for us to let people who we're involved with in this life know far after we've gone. How important it is for us to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How important it is for us to trust God because he's trustworthy. And that God will bless our faith and bless our trust in him uh, to eternal life. Last time we talked about leaving a legacy of love. How important it is for us to know how to love according to scripture, right? Not the way some of these people have been trying to love some of the young people of this world, trying to beat them into submission, but loving them unconditionally, leading them gently to the cross of Christ. And scripture is very clear about how we should do this, very meekly, understanding as Paul told the church in Ephesus, remember where you have come from, idol worship and disobedience. So we need to do so very humbly before God to love people, but love them the right way, by being patient, by being kind, by being understanding, by not seeking our own good, but by seeking their, own, by seeking their good above our own. Uh, by not living our life to boast about ourself, but to pour our life out. As Paul said, I am a drink offering being poured out on the sacrifice and service of your faith. This is love. Loving someone and letting someone know that Jesus had died for them and the consequences of them not trusting in Christ. And so this is what love means. Today we're going to continue on uh, talking about leaving a legacy, but this time we're going to talk about leaving a legacy of devotion to the Bible, devotion to God's Word. You know, I've got 
I've got many books. Matter of fact, I've, I've got so many books. Um, and I've also got books on the computer, which I mostly read now. My wife continues to tell me, you need to do something with them books. <laughs> I have brought some of them here for you to take, and I'll be bringing more as well for you to take if you'd like, so, like to do so. And if you know anybody that would actually read the books, I've got plenty of books, uh, and mostly on the Bible. I've even got a prize possession, which I probably won't part with, but... It's uh, a 1800s copy of Pilgrim's Progress written by John Bunyan. Uh, and uh, I believe the second best book next to the Bible. But, um, you know, I'll, I could leave that book to my, to my, my daughters and um, it's, it's not worth a whole lot of money. But things we leave to our family, what matters most is things that will last not just a lifetime, but lifetimes. And letting our family know that the Bible that we have sitting on the shelf or that we have sitting on the coffee table is not there for decoration. And even not just with your children or with your husband or with your wife or even with your grandchildren, how important is it for you to even let people you work with know that the Bible is everything to you. How are they to know that? Especially if you go around misquoting it because you don't know it very well. Like so many people do today. You know, I've heard, I've heard plenty of times, especially in a church we used to go to, where one guy would pop up all the time and said, God only helps those who help themselves. It's in the Bible. No, it's not in the Bible. God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps those who help other people. <laughs> Uh, so uh, God helps those who completely depend on him. So being devoted to the Bible does more than transform our life. It also transforms the lives of the people around us who see our love and devotion for God's word. And that's what we're going to talk about today. First thing we're going to talk about, why should I leave a legacy of devotion to the Bible. Why is it so important? Why is the Bible so important? Because there are a lot of opinions out there, especially uh, from those who uh, are against the Bible, those who believe the Bible is a fictitious book that at one time men had written down to manipulate other people. There are millions of people in this country and abroad who believe that very fact. So why is it so important? Well, we're going to discover um, what the Bible has to say about itself uh, and see uh, why it's so important to be devoted to the Bible and to leave a legacy of devotion to it. First thing, we're going to read a couple passages. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 7 and 8. And then its corresponding passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. Let's take a look at Isaiah first. <clears throat> chapter 40 is one of my favorite chapters. Um, the prophet writes this by the Holy Spirit's power. He says, The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass may wither and the flower fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. <coughs> now let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. And the Apostle Peter, by the Spirit of the Lord, quotes this verse. He says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. And the seed he's talking about is the, the word of God. He says, through the living and abiding word of God. He says, for all flesh is like grass. It means all people are like grass. And all of our glory is like the flower of the grass. For the grass withers as do our own bodies and our own lives. And even our glory falls away like the flower falls away in the field. 
he said, but the word of the Lord stands forever. So scripture tells us very clearly, why is being devoted to the Bible so important? Because God's word is as he is eternal, right? It is eternal. It is the only thing that we can have that no one can ever take away. You know, Hitler, when he came to power, he got into the book burning business. He didn't want anybody reading anything that he didn't want them to read. They could burn every Bible on the face of the earth, but they can't take it out of here. When we trust God as our Savior, when we read and study his word, God begins to do something in our life. That word begins to take root. That word begins to find its imprint upon our hearts and in our minds. You can never take away the word of the Lord because the word of the Lord comes from the mouth of the Lord. And because the Lord is eternal, so is his word. It is the only thing that we know that is eternal. Peter made it very clear. Isaiah said, the grass in the field is here one day and the grass of the field is gone the next. The flowers in the field are here one day and the next day are left. Peter compares them by the Spirit's power to human beings. We, like the grass, are alive today. And even our glory, in all of our glory, you know, and all, there, there's a lot of people in this world that, ha that have a lot of glory. They, you know, you look at, you look at Donald Trump himself, our president, is a multi, multi, multi billionaire, right? He owns, I don't know how much real estate. The guy has so much power, now he's president of the United States. Yet someday, Donald Trump won't wake up and he won't be walking on this earth anymore. And neither will his glory, for it will all fade. Brandy read about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was one of the greatest kings. Not great in morality, but great in power. One of the greatest kings who ever reigned on the face of this earth. He ruled most of the known world. Yet, one day when he failed to give glory to God and only gave glory to himself, God made him crawl about the wilderness like an animal. And he barked at the moon like an animal for a year of his life until he gave glory to God and God brought healing to him. And Nebuchadnezzar, he, you know, the hanging gardens in Babylon was considered one of the most beautiful places in the world. Now all of that has faded away. Nebuchadnezzar is nothing but a name written on, written in the Bible and also written on stone, on a steel. You can read about Nebuchadnezzar. But the only thing that lasts forever is the Bible. The Bible is the oldest book that's still around today and more widely read by any person on the face of the earth. The Bible is thousands, not hundreds, thousands of years old. And it's the same. It's not been changed. Oh, it's been translated into other languages. And it's even been modernized in today's modern language. But you can even still read copies. I've got copies of the Bible that are thousands of years old. So the Bible is eternal. And even if every Bible, every book was burned on the face of this earth, God's word still stands. So that's why God's word is so important. And being devoted to it is so important. Because it's the only thing that's eternal that we can possess as human beings. You want to leave something great to your to your family, to your friends, when you leave this world, to people whom you love, you care for, then leave them the word of the Lord and let them see how important God's word is to you. In our focus passage, actually, if you see on your uh, study guide, you'll see two passages in, in the title, and that's because 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 through 12. That's, that's our general passage for the series, okay? And that's the passage that, that talks about the importance of living a legacy. And then each week we look at a different focus passage that speaks to what kind of legacy we should leave. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12 of the series passage, Peter talks about the prophets. And these prophets 
as we talked about every week, these prophets, they spoke the word of God, didn't they? God, that's what a prophet did. God brought his word to the prophet's ear, and the prophet spoke the word of the Lord. The prophets mentioned in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, devoted their whole lives to God's word and to the preaching of God's word to other people. And if they would have not been devoted to it, then we would lose the benefit which we have. And what benefit is that? Because of their devotion to God's word, we have the Bible. Right? Most of the Old Testament were written all by prophets. And if you consider them who brought the word of God in the New Testament, they were prophets themselves. A prophet was one who spoke the word of the, uh, the, word of the Lord, not just one who foretold the future. Most people think about prophecy as someone being a fortune teller. Being a prophet was no such thing. Being a prophet was one who spoke the word of God. God did not speak directly to everybody. God did so through a messenger, and that's what a prophet was. He did not only... Uh, foretell. He also foretold everything that was going on, even, even things that went on in the past. He described what they meant in their interpretation. So because of these prophets, because of their devotion to God's word, to the Bible, to the preaching of it, even when you read, when we, we read Hebrews chapter 11, many of them prophets were killed because they devoted themselves to God's word. Look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah was thrown in prison, I don't know how many times, dumped down a well, left for dead. All because he devoted himself to telling God's people God's holy word. They did all this because they loved God and loved his word and loved people. And they knew that God's word was the only thing that can bring transformation. That's what we're going to talk about next. Why we should leave this legacy. Timothy's mother and grandmother... In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, I love this passage. Um, Timothy, his father was a Greek, and his mother was a Jew, and his grandmother was a Jew. And they did what they believed was the most important thing in their life. Look what it says. Paul says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, he's speaking to Timothy, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying out of my hands. He says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. So here Paul says that, it's because of Timothy's mother and grandmother that he had come to believe in the Lord Jesus. That he had placed his faith and trust in God and God alone. Because of his mother and grandmother, Timothy had become a child of faith, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, one who uh, no longer was living in sin, but following after God. Look what it says uh, in verse 14. But as for you now, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. So Paul says to Timothy in verse 14, uh, uh, chapter 3, I want you to remember who taught you the Bible. And how childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul talks about in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 3 that Timothy learned the word of God from somebody, even from childhood. Chapter 1, verse 5 tells us that these two people was his mother and his grandmother. They believed leaving a legacy of devotion to God's word was important because it knew that it was Timothy's only way to find forgiveness and eternal life in the Lord Jesus and for Timothy to be rescued from his sin and to become a child of God. It 
It led Timothy to salvation. And it led him to his lifelong commitment to serving God and serving God's church. Timothy wind up becoming a pastor in the church. He wind up serving the Lord. All because his mother and grandmother thought it was important to plant the seed of God's word. And they left this legacy in his life. It's important for us to leave legacies. You know, Brandy was talking about earlier, she's so concerned about this young woman that she has befriended at work. The greatest thing Brandy can do for that woman is to show this woman that she loves God's word and how important God's word is because God's word transformed her life. God's word can transform her friend's life as well. People are not going to want to believe that the Bible is God's word and that it's important, that it's going to bring me life if it's not important to you, right? How important would God's word be to my own children if my own children didn't see me pick up the Bible and read it, spend time studying it? That I wouldn't use God's word as a reference for how we're supposed to live our life and decisions that we're supposed to make in life. If we're not devoted to it, the people around us will not see that devotion. How are they going to be devoted to it if we're not, right? Psalm chapter 1. This is another reason why we should be devoted to the Bible. I love this passage. Um, it's my favorite psalm of all the psalms, and there are 150 of them. Psalm chapter 1 begins by saying, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, which means he doesn't get his advice from wicked, evil people. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners, which means he doesn't get involved in the sinful things with, uh, with other people. Nor does he sit in the seat of a scoffer. He doesn't, he doesn't delight himself in, you know, he, he talks about a progression. He said the person who gets his counsel from evil people winds up doing evil things with evil people, and they wind up becoming an evil person themselves, an evil person who scoffs, which means they call uh, what's evil righteous and what's righteous evil. This person who is blessed does not get mixed up into the things, the sinful things of this world, but they take their delight in the word of God, the law of God. And on his law, on his word, they meditate day and night. They are like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he shall prosper. You see, a person who is devoted to the Bible is a person who will always be fruitful. It will make you fruitful if you devote yourself to it like a tree planted by streams of waters whose leaf will never wither. I got a big, ugly tree in my front yard that I absolutely hate. It's a big, ugly elm tree that got a Chinese elm that got struck by the elm, Chinese elm disease the, the tree, back in, I don't know when it was, back in the 70s. And... This tree is so ugly looking in the wintertime, just completely dead look, looking. It has not one leaf on it. When we devote ourselves to God's word, we won't be like my ugly tree with not a leaf on it. We'll be like the evergreens on the other side of my yard. They're always green. They're always beautiful, you know. That's what we'll be like if we devote ourselves to God's word. And that beauty that we see in God's word other people will see it once they see it in us. How can we ever? We don't want to leave a legacy. Oh, that person, you know, they, they work really hard, which is a good thing. But even the things that we collect for ourselves in this life, someday they'll go away. Even if we leave a big pile of money to family and friends, They'll spend it, and when they spend it, it's gone. But if we leave a love for God's word, that will last other people a lifetime. So, we saw the importance, right, of 
being devoted to God's word, of leaving a legacy of devotion to God's word. We saw uh, how, it, how others who had invested in other people's lives, like Timothy's mother and grandmother, how it changed his life, right? He became, he became saved, he became a pastor in a church. We saw the prophets of old who dedicated themselves to the word of God. If they would not have, we wouldn't have the Bible today. So leaving a legacy is so important because it is the only way we can ever be fruitful in this life. Truly bear fruit. Fruit that lasts. Does not, doesn't come and go like the changing of the seasons. But fruit that lasts all winter long. You know? We must be devoted to the word of the Lord. But how can we get to that place? What steps can we take to devote ourselves to the Bible so that we can leave this all-important legacy? Well, I want us to take a look at an Old Testament passage, the book of Ezra, chapter 7, verse 10. The book of Ezra, chapter 7, verse 10. Ezra is right after 2 Chronicles, right before Nehemiah. Now, let me just very briefly tell you who Ezra was. Ezra was a scribe. What is a scribe, you may ask? Well, not everybody in those days could read and write, okay? A matter of fact, reading and writing was a privilege and one that you could only obtain if you went, especially if you were a, a Jew or, or an Israelite, if you went to Hebrew school, if you went to the temple or to a synagogue in the time of Ezra, uh, because Ezra lived in the time when Babylon had defeated uh, uh, the southern portion of Israel, taking all their people captive to Babylon. They destroyed the temple, and the people were living in exile as slaves. Ezra lived in the time when uh, the Medes and the Persians had come to power and had defeated the Babylonians. And then this is the time uh, uh, of Esther, when uh, the Jews lived in uh Babylon, when the Persians were reigning in power. This is the time when Purim, the, the holiday of Purim had come. So Ezra, his job was to copy the Bible so other people can have a copy. His job was to write it out, to read it, and to interpret it. This was his job. He was a, a Bible student. So he read the Bible, studied the Bible, and even recopied the Bible uh, so that other people can have copies of it. Matter of fact, that's still done today uh, uh, in the Jewish community. The Bible, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, as it's called, is still hand copied. They have uh, people they call sophorites that copy it by hand. Each letter is perfectly done. And if it's, if it's not perfectly done, it's destroyed and redone. But this was his job, and it was an, a very important job, okay? But I'm gonna, we're going to read Ezra's approach to the Bible, okay? It says, For Ezra had set his heart first to study the law of the Lord, to study the Word of God, okay? Next, his heart was to do it, to practice it. And last but not least, to teach his ways, to teach God's word and his rules and all of Israel. So we're going to take Ezra's approach to being devoted to God's word. First thing, study God's word. Study it, right? That's what the first thing Ezra did. He studied God's word because how can I become familiar with something if I don't read it? And if I don't examine it, right? And this word study, in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, it means three things, okay? It means first to seek it, 
to inquire about it and to care for it. There are many people that have sought to read the Bible. I, I've met a few people that have sought to read the Bible and still don't believe in it. So just because you read it, don't mean, mean you believe in it. You have to read it as it is. It is God's word. Otherwise, it's not going to transform your life. If you think it's just man's manipulation to try and overcome you, nowhere in the Bible does it talk about believing in God so that you can be overtaken by anybody else. It is so that you can be overcome by God and that you can bask in his glory and his love for eternity. So the word study uh, is very important. We need to inquire about the Bible. We need to care for it. We need to be devoted to it. It needs to mean something to us. We need to seek it. You know, I, I watched this program on TV. I don't know if you had... Um, and it's called uh, The Curse of Oak Island. Anybody watch this program on, uh, on TV? They're Oak Island, help me out, Natalie, where this place is at. I have no idea. Uh, it's in the Netherlands, I think. Okay? And for 250 years, there's been uh, a belief that there's treasure on this island. There has been people, I kid you not, for 200 years that have been going to this place on Oak Island and have been digging in the ground hundreds of feet trying to find some kind of sunken treasure, somebody buried. There's a group of men now have spent millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. People even <laughs> lost their life to try and dig down to find some treasure. And all the while, God's word's been sitting there on the shelf, the greatest treasure Amen. of all. You can find all that gold. Someday you're going to die and be separated from that gold and what goods are going to do you. But if you devote yourself to God's word and leave that word for other people to read and let them know how important it is, you have done an eternity's worth of work because the people that you let know how important God's word is and they saw your love and devotion to God's word, that's going to take them to eternity. They're going to be talking about it in heaven. You know, the people that you touch with your life that are going to be with you in heaven, you're going to be talking about that for millions of years. Isn't that the greater investment? Mm -hmm. That's the greater investment, don't you think? Yes. Like the investment that we made in Paula's life, Paula is now in heaven. And Paula made an investment in our life, and we're going to take that with us as well. That's the greatest investment we can make is an investment in each other to love each other, and to share God's word with each other, and to care for one another, right? That's the kind of legacies we're talking about leaving. But studying God's word just don't mean reading it, and reading it, and reading it, and reading it. David, King David, made something very important in Psalm 1. If you remember, we read in Psalm 1, David said, I meditate on God's word day and night. Meditating is so important. You know, the Buddhists... They, they believe meditation, which means to sit in the quiet and to make certain sounds and to try to empty the mind, to try to meditate, brings self-healing, self-awareness, and lets go of all the issues of life. Well, it's not true, because once you stop chanting, the issues of life are still there. But if you meditate, rather, think about God's word and what it's saying and what it's meaning. Guys, I spent, when I spend time just thinking about God's word in silence, I gain more information about what God is saying, and it affects my life in a way that it could never affect my life if I didn't do that. Meditating on God's word is so important. Get to a place where it's quiet and you're away from everybody, and think about what you read. Ask God in your mind. Be still in your heart and ask God, what are you saying? We don't sometimes have to speak to use this, right? So we've got to be quiet to use this. You ever been in a noisy place? You say, I just can't think of it. It's too noisy. We've got to get away where it's quiet so we can just think about God's word and what God's word means. And then God's word will begin to take on, uh, we'll begin to take on new insights into God's word that we've never had before. God's word takes on like a new life in our life when we spend time meditating on it. So studying God's word is the first thing we want to do. We want to get into reading it 
Coming to church is a great way to do that, right? You come here, you come here today to hear God's word. That's a great thing to do. Just keep on doing that. Do that at home as well. Take these study guides when you go home and read these passages this week. Spend some time meditating on it. Because sometimes when you look at God's word, it, 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 God's word only has one meaning, right? Though each passage only has one meaning. But it has multiple ways we can apply it to our life. It can affect your life in many different ways. as It can affect my life even in different ways. So those are personal things, those applications, and how God's word transforms us. And that can only be done as we sit and meditate on God's word. Second thing. We saw that Ezra did not just study God's word, but he put it into practice, right? He put it into practice. So Ezra committed himself to read and study God's word uh, by reading it, meditating on it, even hand copying it. Uh, and then he committed himself to practicing it or living by God's word. Why is living by God's word so important being devoted to it? Well, James tells us why. Let's, let's take a look at James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. James tells us why it's so important not just to read God's word, not just to meditate on God's word, but we must live by it. Look what he says. James, by the Spirit of the Lord, says, Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. Why? He says, because in doing so, you're deceiving yourself. If anyone is just a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. So what is he saying? He's saying, if we read the word of God, and don't commit ourselves to living the Word of God, when we're not in the Word of God, we're going to forget what it says. Where it's not going to mean a thing to us. If we don't put it into practice, you never hear the old saying, if you don't use it, you'll lose it, like when you're learning a new language. Um, that's what they say. They say if you're learning a new language and you don't use it, if you don't speak it, you're going to lose it. You're going to forget it. But that's what James is saying. James is saying, if I put myself to reading and hearing God's word and studying God's word, and I don't put it into practice, there's no practical application in my life. I don't see God's word in my life transforming me, changing me, changing the way I think, changing the way I speak, changing the way I act. If God's word is not, not producing anything in my life, then it's not going to mean anything to me. I want to go away and I'm just going to forget what it says. It makes common sense, right? It's common sense if we don't commit ourselves to it. He goes on to say in verse 25, but the one who looks intently, deeply into the perfect law, the word of God, the law of liberty, and perseveres being not just a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed. So we must not just commit ourselves to just like the, the, the man I met in Des Moines who said, I mean, he was quoting Bible verse after Bible verse, but he didn't believe it at all. It had made no change in his life at all. Okay, it made no change in his life. He was not blessed by it. But me, on the other hand, God's word took root in my life. I believed it. I placed my faith and trust in Jesus, and my life has forever changed. I've been forever changed since. And God is gradually and gradually increasing me, increasing me, increasing my faith, increasing my understanding. It doesn't get me a better place in heaven, but what it does is prepare me more to leave even more legacies, to leave to, leave to, to many more people the word of God. You know, my, my, my friend who, who's a, a Muslim, he's married to my cousin. Um, he can see that I'm devoted to God's word. He said it. Matter of fact, he even told people, and he's a, he, was, he was a Muslim at the time. He's not now, or at least he doesn't practice it. He told people at one time they need to go, they need to, go to our church. He said, you need to go there. He said, he'll teach you the word of God. 
Now, he said this about the Bible. And he didn't believe in it. Because people see our devotion. They see if we're devoted or not devoted. If we're devoted, it makes a difference in people's life. If we're not devoted, it'll make a difference, but the opposite way. They'll say, oh, that person, they say they, they love the Bible. They say the Bible is important. I never see them read it, never hear them quoting it, and I definitely don't see them living by it, so it must not be all that. And they just dismiss it as being a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. You know, how can we tell the world, the dying world, as we sung in that song, how can we tell the dying world about Jesus and how important the word of God is, the gospel, which is the word of God, that it will save them? If they don't see us speaking it, living it, or caring about it at all, they don't see any transformation in our own life. You can tell the whole world that you believe in God, but the world knows whether you do or whether you don't. And that's, the tr and that's the truth. So living by it is so vitally important. As James says, you're deceiving yourself if you think that's all you got to do is come to church and hear it. Maybe you read it occasionally at home. Never spend no time meditating on it. Not devoted to wanting to live by it. It will not bless you. You will not be blessed by it. It will make no effectual change in your life. You're just deceiving yourself. It profits us nothing. If you read and study God's word and never put it into practice, it's no profit at all. The third, third thing that Ezra did, that he devoted himself to teaching God's word. So you see the progression here, right? You see that he first learned the word himself. Then he committed himself to living by it. He wasn't waiting for himself to be perfect, by the way, because he wasn't perfect as you and I are not perfect. But he committed himself to saying, as Joshua did, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will follow the Lord. I'm going to commit myself to living by God's word. That's my commitment. You see, it's impossible for us to be able to teach it if we first don't study it, read it, and commit ourselves to live by it. Many people want to skip the first two steps and get right to telling everybody else what to do. Because so many people just want to tell people what to do, right? They'll even go so far as to misquote the Bible. There was an article I read on CNN, and I know this guy wasn't saved, but he was just bashing so many people who call themselves Christians who say things that are absolutely not in the Bible. And it makes Christians look like idiots. So if we don't want to look like an idiot, if we want to look to the world like we're we know what we're talking about because we really care about the world and we want to see the world come to faith in Jesus, then let's get with the Bible. Amen? When people depart and detract from the Bible, this is when the church begins to break down. If you don't believe me, read history. Go back into the, to the dark ages. It wasn't dark because he didn't have electricity. It was dark because their understanding was dark. At one time, the Catholic Church believed if you stare at the bones of the relics that they got from the Holy Land, you'll be able to go into heaven. At one time, they believed this. They did not know the Word of God. This is what happens. You know what Jesus says? You become a blind person. And if you're a blind person leading another person, you're both going to fall down into the pit. Let's open our eyes and see the truth, the word of God. Amen? So that our feet will be going down the right path so that we can lead everybody else down the right path. If I'm going the wrong way and people are following me, we're all going the wrong way. That's not going to do anybody any good. Amen? Amen. Let's put it into practice. Right? Let's put it into practice. Let's take a look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Um, I got to be honest, when I started thinking about being devoted to God's word, I thought about Paul and Timothy. And this, this, is, why, this is why we're here. Um, I believe the Lord brought that to my attention. Uh, 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16 and 17. All scripture 
This means Old Testament and New Testament. It means every part of the Word of God is breathed out by God or God breathed or comes from the mouth of the Lord. All right? So right away it's telling us that, that God spoke to men and men wrote the Bible. Why did God do it that way? Because God used these certain men. And I can tell you, there are, I think, over 40 different writers in the Bible. And they all lived at different times. Some of them hundreds of years apart, if not over a thousand. And they all agree. A lot of people say, well, you know, that's not true. Yes, it is. And someday we'll sit down and I'll explain it to you. Um, people say, well, there are a few certain discrepancies in the Bible. They're there for a reason. And we'll sit down talking. And this was a way of writing. There are plenty of uh, external writings, especially by Plutarch, um, where that type of style of writing, um, where people present things. Jesus um, had his gospel presented by four different people in four different ways uh, to speak about all the different aspects of his life and how it affected those four different men and their, and their four different ways of understanding his same message. And they all preach the same message that Jesus preached. So it's an amazing, an amazing thing. But it says, all scripture comes out of the mouth of God and it's profitable, right? It's profitable. It's prof profitable for what? For teaching, right? For teaching. So God's word's important for teaching. Why? So that we can reprove people when they're being outrightly disobedient and don't want to obey, to correct them when they're wrong, and to train them, all of this is to train them for holiness, to train them in righteousness, in the ways of God. So scripture is important to teach it. Without teaching God's word, we can't give people this profitable gift. God's word is a profitable gift that we can share with other people that will train them in the ways of righteousness. It's no different than, you know, when if you want to share something with somebody, whether it be your child or sometimes children even teach their parents things. <laughs> uh, my children have taught me many things. And if we want to share something with somebody to enlighten them, we must share it with them. And that is teaching. And if we could just get the person to sit down and shut up and listen and teach God's word. It takes effort to do so, though. It takes effort. What effort does it take? First, we have to commit ourselves to learning it, right? You guys ever remember that episode, if you've ever seen it, of Cheers? Remember that old show Cheers used to be on the 80s? Remember the... Mailman used to walk in. I might remember what his name was. I forget his name. Cliff. Cliff. Cliff would always be talking about something that he knew nothing about. He would always say stuff that meant no sense. He always gave information that was absolutely wrong. We don't want to be like Cliff. When we talk about something, we want to know what we're talking about. So many people, as this guy from CNN said, so many people are sharing the Bible and don't know what they're sharing. We're giving God and his followers a really bad name by claiming to be something and to know something we know absolutely nothing about. And why don't we know anything about it? Because we don't spend any time in it. None. It's just like this episode I saw once of, uh, I don't know whether it was The Tonight Show or whatever, Jay Leno went out, was interviewing people, and asking people about questions about the Bible, asking people about questions about our country's history. They knew nothing about it. Yet they could name every beer, the name of every beer. He asked these, these young people, what, what, what's the name of all these domestic beers? Well, they were just rattling them off, one beer right after the other. But they couldn't name the presidents of our United States. They couldn't name the first three presidents. They could, they, they could not quote anything at all from the Bible. They misquoted the Ten Commandments. They couldn't even get two or three right. But they didn't forget the names of the, of the beers that they sell in America, domestic beers. This is, this is what happened. So the point is, we know what we spend time in getting to know. 
right? We'll know the Bible if we spend time getting to know the Bible. And wouldn't you think that we should get to know something that's eternal? Something that will bless us, that will make us fruitful all the time? Something that we can hand down to other people and they can hand it down and take it with them all the way to heaven. You can't take money and valuables to heaven. When Paula passed on, the, the guy gave me Paula's jewelry because she can't take it with her, right? But what Paula did take with her was the word of God, Amen. was the promises that God had made to her, was the investments that people made in her life, the investments that she made in other people's lives. That's what she took with her to heaven. If we want to leave a legacy that will last lifetimes, let's leave a legacy of devotion to God's word. We must pass it on, as Timothy's mother and grandmother did to him. We must pass it on. Let's pass it on to our children. Uh, guys, I passed it on to my parents. We can pass it on to our cousins, our nieces, our nephews. We can pass it on to our friends, to our co-workers, even to people that we just meet just for a moment. We can pass God's word on to them as well. You know, when, when we go on vacation, one of the first things my family thinks about is we need to take tracks. We need to share God's word when we go. Connie does it. Brandy does it all the time. Every time we go somewhere, they take tracks. They take God's word with them and they pass it on. You never know if you might not meet that person again, but we can pass God's word on. We can leave. That's how we leave a legacy. If you're devoted to God's word, you're going to be devoted to it to everybody you meet. Let's pass on God's word. Let's leave a legacy that will last forever. Now, remember, guys, go out and be a light to the nations. Shine brightly the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much.